Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for a special, well, yeah, special edition of the show because it's the Thanksgiving special for 2014. So, yeah, um, got the haircut, but the next, like, what, well, two or three episodes you're going to see, uh, um, I'm going to have longer hair and a little bit scragglier beard and all that because, well, though, so Napa. So, real quick, we'll talk about Napa. Um, amazing trip. Um... We got seven interviews total. So last week was Free Mark Abbey. Next week is Paul Maz. Um, I'll just tell you straight up, Paul Maz is probably the most technologically advanced uh, winery on the planet, um, and that's about as far as I'm going to go. I'll let you, I'll let you uh, watch the interview. We got some really cool stuff to put into the interview um, to show you uh, how cool it is, but. Um, so that's going to be next week. We got a few more after that. So uh, we got some great interviews. Had you know a couple wineries uh, with this, the tour and what they do kind of blew us away. Palm Oz is one of those. Um, Freemark Abbey was last week. That was cool. Ted Edwards um, did a gr uh, did great. Gave us a great little tour. Uh, and what's cool with Ted was we got to talk, got to geek out about the chemistry about winemaking. And I think sometimes we forget that uh, winemakers kind of have to be chemists. They have to know all this stuff. And, you know, it's not just, you know, oh, just throw a little bit of yeast in there and let it ferment and I'm good. You know, they've, they've got to be taking all these measurements with acid, well, so pH, uh, sugar level, um, temperature, how, uh, how much sugar, yeah, how much sugar levels left, to, you know, what the bricks is all this kind of stuff, and then tasting at the same time, and they got to do all these chemical analyses. So you have to remember there's a lab involved in all this too. Um, and it's not a lab as far as like, you know, bulk commercial, I mean, they exist. But even these smaller wineries that are boutique, they have labs too because they need to know this information. Um, so anyway, uh, again, thank you, Ted. Uh, it was great to sit down with you. And then um, we're going to do... Uh, uh, we're going to do uh, Thanksgiving here in a second. Uh, I do want to talk about some of the other wineries I did visit that we did not do interviews. Now, a couple of them, I just went to the tasting room, um, didn't have any appointments. Uh, a couple of them, I had a, already had appointments before I got to Napa. Some of them, I made appointments after I was there. And one of them, I just kind of walked in. Um, appointment only, but I was able to get in there. So uh, that one was, well, we'll just start off. Montalena, I made the, the kind of obligatory visit to Montalena. If you've ever seen the movie Bottle Shock, uh, it was cool. Again, no appointment, went to the taste room, let them know who I was, who, you know, about the podcast and who, uh, the restaurant I work at. And um, there's only one person really work in the room for a little bit, then another person came in. So uh, I was able to get like a really, really quick tour of just go down to the winery itself so you know you got to see well you know what the winery really looked like um in the movie versus what the set was um but uh and maybe back in the 70s it looked a little bit different but um so that was kind of cool um went to ladera ladera is a really cool wine um they have a howl mountain cab that is outstanding um i particularly like it so you're not gonna see it get reviewed because i've already had it I mean, maybe if a, a, a future vintage comes along that I haven't tried already, I might review it. But just trust me, it's a really good value. Uh, not value. Well, it is a good value, I guess. But it's not a value wine. But it's a really good wine for the price you're going to pay. Um, we also went to um, see a couple of the uh, tasting rooms we went to. Went to Duckhorn. Uh, really cool there. They do like a whole little educational thing. You get like an educator that goes over the wines. Um so that was cool to visit and great, it was a great uh, facility set out on the porch. It was a beautiful day. It was an awesome little visit. Uh, Frank family, uh, that was really cool because I got to learn about uh, that the gentleman who owns the, the, the winery um, is in the movie 
entertainment business, has all these movie posters around. He's a producer, all this kind of stuff. You know, wine is a passion, but he has all this other stuff. And it was really cool. Um, got to do the little, uh, like, uh, reserve tasting with them. Um, did continue, well, we'll do continue in a second. Did Opus One, Opus One blew us away with uh, just, you know, just how it was designed and all that. Really cool, of course, high-end wine. Had an appointment ahead of time. You kind of have an appointment with them. Um, but uh, really relaxing tour. Uh, just kind of really cool. The, the building is really cool. They call it the spaceship. I think it's kind of timeless, but I, I kind of like that style of architecture. Um, Continuum. Now, Continuum was really cool. Um, the person that was our host was from Texas, had just moved there two weeks prior. So um, we pull up, saw a Texas car, because we drove the whole way there. So we're in our Texas car. I thought, oh, we got you know somebody joining us on the appointment, you know, from Texas. Walk in, ask the the woman that was taking care of us. It's like, oh, who else is from Texas? She goes, me. So that was awesome. Like we had a little personalized menu. Said, welcome, fellow Texans. Uh, my dad, first time, well, not first time ever, but one of the first times he's had wine with food and went, oh wow, my dad's not really a big wine person. Uh, he likes wine. He likes the $4, $4 bottle, and he likes the $400 bottle. But to him, it's wine, and why would I pay $400 for a bottle if I can get something that tastes just as good for 4 bucks? But that visit, um, because of how they paired the food with the wine, was one of the few times um, he's ever had the wine not just change in flavor, but taste better. And he kind of went, oh, maybe this is worth the amount of money you're going to pay for this wine, because Continuum is not cheap. Um, Let's see, uh, made some appointments after I got there at Inglenook. Um, that was really cool. And Inglenook, the brand I know for a while was like cheap wine, but they're, you know, they, they've recaptured the brand. Um, they're trying to put it back into the map where it was, it used to be high level wine and, and that's what it is now. So got a, uh, some cool tastings there. Cardinal, Cardinal is, yeah, pretty amazing. Um, another amazing trip. So I, I drank their Cardinal and their La Coya. Um, they're also owned by Jackson Family Wines, which also owns Freemark Abbey um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, um, and, so the Kendall Jackson family. But Cardinal is not like some like new thing. They've been there for quite a while. I think since the 80s, if I remember correctly. So they've been making this wine for a long time. It's not, you know, Jackson Family said, Oh, let's just like, you know, pop up a winery somewhere and, you know, charge a lot of money for it. I mean, they've been doing that for a long time. Um, let's see. What, who else do we have? Tasting room visits. I think that was it for just the impromptu. I popped in or we had or we already had an appointment. Oh, uh, Gergich. Um, Gergich was just a tasting room thing. They were kind of busy. It was, you know, I wish we could have done more with them. You know, Mike Gergich was the winemaker from Montalano. It been really cool um, to, to really kind of get into Gergich with a tour and an interview and all that. But um, weren't able to do that. But uh, I just was kind of a little quick in and out really there. Um, I wish we could have done more, but I just didn't have the time. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it was, it was a really cool visit. And then, of course, we went to Sonoma. We only did the two wineries there that I had the interviews. But... I can tell you, Sonoma and Napa, really a huge difference in topography. Napa is a valley. You got mountains and a valley. Whereas Sonoma's you know, rolling hills. Sorry, I was watching the little thing. Um, you know, lots of hills. So that was really cool. Um, and, then, um, and then the last winery, um, which is kind of the real treat um, of, of the trip, one of the treats of the trip. Uh, in Arizona, and uh, that was Caduceus, which is an interview. So um, we'll get into that when we get to the interview. I won't go into more other than uh, the gentleman that sat down with me is probably one of the coolest people I've met. So um, Brian, if you're watching this episode, uh, you're pretty awesome, okay? Uh, anyway, so uh, the timer went off. That meant I went a little long talking about the stuff. Let's get into the wine. Maybe have a commercial break. If you're watching on Blip and the website, of course, if you're watching on TiVo or the podcast, there are no commercials. So when the little curtain closes, that's where a commercial is supposed to happen from Blip TV. Some point in time, I might actually 
have real commercials, but I, I gotta get it. Gotta get a commercial to use. All right, so let's um, let's hit the first wine. Okay, start that up. All right, so Thanksgiving wines. So, like you know that 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 thing that everybody has um, opinions and that everyone's got them. So this year I went pretty traditional, um, almost too traditional. And and when we get to the the middle wines, I'll kind of talk to you about why we're doing this. Um, but uh, so anyway, you can tell what I have. You can see the bottles. So you obviously know what we're gonna do. So let's get into the Chardonnay first. Okay, so Chardonnay just, you know, is, is a, a good, just all around wine that can, that can pair with so much stuff. Um, so it's something that, uh, not necessarily a safe bet, but you know, if you have a Chardonnay at Thanksgiving dinner, it's, it's gonna go, well, some, most Chardonnay should hopefully go over well, but it's going to be a wine that will go well with the food, okay? Chardonnay in general is a good food, uh, food wine. So this, so this wine, I forgot to stop the recording, but that's okay. We're going to go straight through and then I'll do the little chops. Um, anyway, so this wine is the Iron Horse uh, Vineyards Rude or Rued. Clone Chardonnay from 2008. Um, I paid 20. So here's the deal. This is one of the wines I got from Underground Cellars, UndergroundCellar.com. Um, I feel like I'm talking really fast. I'm trying to rush through this. I'm tired. I, you know, it's freaking three in the morning. I worked tonight. I was supposed to do this last night, but I didn't do my research on the wines. I was really tired. I said, "F it. I'm gonna go to bed." I did all the research this morning and. Not on this computer, but the but the, the the desktop had all my things in notes, the notes app. I had two hours worth of worth of stuff, and then I took my little nap before I go to work, wake up, and it's all gone. Or most of it was gone. I was just livid. So anyway, so the the research is there. I just it wasn't as it's not gonna be as succinct as it as it should have been. Anyway, so um $27 was the deal at, at Underground Cellar. So it was what they called their giddy up uh, deal for Chardonnay and basically focusing on, on Iron Horse. So um, $27 was the, was the entry price. You paid 27 bucks and you were guaranteed the, the $27 bottle of wine. Well, I got an upgrade because that was one of the deals with Underground Cellar. You have the potential of getting an upgrade if you only buy one bottle, if you buy more bottles, so if I think it's like three typically, you're guaranteed at least one upgrade. Now that could be the one upgrade above or it could be two or three, however many upgrades are, but you're guaranteed to get more than just, if you buy three bottles, you're gonna get probably two of the entry level and at least one higher, or you may get two higher, who knows? So, um, and then however many wines you buy, there's more guarantees and all that. So. Um, this wine costs forty-eight dollars normally from the from the winery, but twenty-seven dollars I paid for it at the um, an underground cellar. So, who is Iron Horse? Well, Iron Horse has been around for quite a while. Um, they are, I think, I think actually one of their 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 um, awards was like an iconic winery or iconic historical place, or whatever. Um, but so let's kind of go through, um, let's kind of go through the history of Iron Horse. So it was founded by Audrey and Barry Sterling in February of 1976. Um, so basically, what happened was they were driving through Sonoma and they kind of stumbled upon the winery. They crested a hill, thinking they were lost, and they found they saw this this uh, this area and said, "This is it." Okay, so we we kind of cut, we kind of like jumped ahead. So let's kind of go back a little bit. All right, so they're both from, they're both native Californians. Um, after law school, Barry founded a law, fir law firm, so he was a lawyer by trade. Um, for his 30th birthday, they took a trip to Europe. And um, that is where the whole, um, th that's kind of where things kind of, the spark of, 
you know, the wine might be kind of cool, you know, like a winery and a vineyard and all that. Um, they think that it's like, hey, this is kind of cool. Um, but just a couple of things about them. They founded, uh, they're the founders of the Los Angeles Music Center and the Los Angeles Art Museum. So definitely philip, philip, philanthropic. Um, so very involved with community and arts and all that. So that's cool. Uh, Audrey was appointed as the California Fair Employment Practice Commissioner in 1963 uh, by then Governor Edmund Pat Brown. So in 1967, they decided to move to Paris. Um, and this kind of, this really is where their idea of owning a vineyard or living on a vineyard and growing grapes and making a state wine kind of, kind of got started. Um, and in France, they looked for a long time to find a place to do this. Well, they never found it. So they moved back to the United States and blah, blah, blah. The little trip through Sonoma and they find the property. Um, a few other things about them. They, they are, was considered a, sust uh, sustainable, um, vineyard or, or winery. So they practice sustainability. Um, and, and that's, there's, there's the things that you have to do to be considered sustainable. So you've got sustainable, organic, biodynamic, you got all these different certifications you can get. But the thing about sustainability, just remember is they, they try to, you know, put as much back into the land as possible. Try to be as green, if you want to call it that, you know, like not use any more, not use more power than they need to do, not use more water, not use uh, more materials for packing than they have to, um, try to use recyclable materials, all that kind of stuff to try to, you know, not not use too many resources or more than, more than you need for resources and try to give back as much as you can to it. Um, they also have a thing called precision farming. This is what they call it. Um, and that's... Uh, means all pruning, canopy management, irrigation, cover crop, and even harvesting decisions are determined on a block by block and sometimes vine by vine basis. So, you know, it's it's going out into the vineyards all the time, especially, you know, throughout the whole year. It's not just harvest time, it's going out this time of year, you know, making sure the cover crop is, is growing, make sure you got the hay out there for erosion control, um, having, uh, you know, when bud break happens, making sure you're pruning when you need to prune, make sure your canopy is set so it's protecting the vines, protecting the grapes and all that. Um, you know, going out, going into vineyards all the time to, to get everything right. Um, the estate was named after a railroad stop that, that crossed the property in the 1890s. Um, and Rodney Strong, um, quote, rediscovered it as a vineyard site in 1970. Uh, and he planted the original 55 acres of Chard and the 55 acres of Pinot Noir. Um, oh, I should mention that they are in the Russian River Valley. They're actually in the Green Valley of Russian River Valley. Okay. So perfect area. Uh, it's one of the coolest AVAs as in like temperature, not in like, you know, yo man, I'm just cool. Um, one of the coolest uh, AVAs in Sonoma. And it's kind of an ideal situation. It's also very foggy. So it's really good for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, uh, which is all they make. Um, but anyway, um, so Roddy Strong planted all that. And then 1976, they bought the property. Um, the logo, um, the, the logo, the rampant horse on a weather vane, came from a 19th century weather vane unearthed during construction. Um, if you look, it is a weather vane. It's just, when you first look, it's just like a horse. Then you realize it's actually a weather vane. It's kind of cool. Um, the first vintage of a state Chardonnay was produced in 1978. Um, 1979 was the first Pinot Noir and the official opening of the winery. And then sparkling wine, another wine they are, they are totally known for. Um, first vintage was 1980 for a vintage sparkling wine. Um, they've also been used, uh, they've been, they've been, their sparkling wine's been in the White House for various functions and celebrations since the Reagan administration. So if you've never heard of Iron Horse, you, you need to hear of them. Another cool thing they do, um, they, have a, um, they have a sparkling wine that they do, um, they work with the National Geographic Society and uh, things like, it's four, it is, not think, it is, it's four dollars from every sale of every bottle goes to their, uh, goes to an oceanic, um, thing. I won't call it thing. I just didn't want to have to go to the website to kind of look it up, but, um, yeah, it goes to, 
Uh, it'll, it'll take me a while to figure it out or to find it, but it's an ocean, it's an ocean type of, uh, not charity, but you know, a uh, program to, um, make sure the oceans are good. So anyway, uh, I'm sorry. I don't, I didn't have it. You know what? S screw it. I'm going to find out exactly so I can describe it properly. I mean, it's not going to take that long. Okay. The ocean reserve Blanc de Blanc, um, Iron Horse gives $4 a bottle to the National Geographic's Ocean Initiative. That's what it's called. Establishing marine protected areas and supporting sustainable fishing practices around the globe. Um, and they just have, they have a ton of sparkling wine. Um, so you should check them out. Um, real quick, they have 12 different cuvées. Um, so they have uh, the Ocean Reserve Blanc de Blanc made from 100% Chardonnay to a richly salmon brut rosé. Um, they're all estate bottled. And uh, I'm just going to say they're probably, I don't know if they use any other grape besides Chardonnay and Pinot Noir because that's all their still wines. But um, I should, I've, had, I've had the Ocean Reserve. Um, I've had the Wedding Cuvée. Uh, we had those at Texom. And that was the first time I had ever encountered Iron Horse. And it was good. It was cool, man. I liked it. So let's get into the Chardonnay. Um, let's see. There's something else on my notes about it. Um, oh, the Rude Clone is a more floral and exotic clone of Chardonnay. Um, it is considered native to Green Valley. And then they say the, 2000, the year 2008 will be remembered for its erratic weather. It was hot, cold, mild, hot, cold, hot again, and so on, resulting overall in smaller berries. Uh, on the upside, the low crop allowed us to micromanage each block. Um, okay, I won't go through the rest of it. So let's, let's check out the vine. I won't go through the whole really bad... Hogan's Hero German accent. First of all, you'll notice, like like many, like especially New World Chardonnays, very golden color. Let's see if I can look up um, aging on this. It won't be it won't be the uh, exact same. Um, what you want to call it? Oh, on their website, I don't see the Rude Clone. So maybe they're not making it anymore. Unless this is called something else. All right, well. So on those, a little bit of apple, maybe golden apple, probably because I'm seeing the golden color, so I'm kind of getting that into it. Now it is it isn't too too cold. I mean, I opened them up probably about a half hour ago. I took them out of the refrigerator, so they're 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 a good temperature. And there was something there real quick. It was some type of like spice, but it was real fleeting. But it was it's mostly a little hint of apple. Very the, the aromatics are not a whole lot. Now, it's weird because I've been smelling the wine. I mean, might have been smelling some of these, but I'm pretty sure it was the Chardonnay. When I opened it, I was like, oh, I can smell something. Um, so I don't know why all of a sudden now I can't smell anything. Okay, now reset my nose a little bit. Um, somewhat tropical fruit. I'd almost say banana a little bit. Kind of spicy, as in like spices, like baking spices, a little bit of that. Like clove and those types of things.
So the first thing that really hits me is it's, um, oh, what was the word I was trying to use? I was, I wanted to get the second taste in just to make sure I wasn't like, you know, not getting some, but it was, um, um, rich. It was like a rich wine, like, 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 um, coats the mouth really well. Um, not really high in alcohol. I think it's like 13 something percent alcohol, but it's not, not really high in alcohol. Um, yeah, 13 too. Um, you know, it's, it's got a bit, it's, it's not, uh, it's tasty. First of all, too. That's the other thing. I'm like, just. So again, a little bit of that apple, but really kind of citrusy too. Very, very high acid, you know, pretty acidic, um, kind of citrusy, you know, kind of like a lemon lime type of thing. So um, I don't know if, I mean, they have, they have a wine that they call unoaked. So I'm sure, you know, this one uh, I'm going to say has got to see oak. I mean, it feels like it's got, I mean, the clove and those types of spices on the rum already tell me it has oak, but it doesn't feel like it's. This 100%, you know, new oak, whether it's French or American, and it doesn't feel like it's gone through malolactic. And so I don't get, I don't get a really buttery or creamy, um, not a whole lot, maybe partial malolactic. So maybe some of the wine, maybe half the wine is, goes through mallow, the other half doesn't. Um, you know, my trips to, to the wineries, when we talk about, you know, uh, especially Chardonnay, sometimes they, they bring up, well, half is, you know, 50% mallow and 50% non-mallow. So it, it, in a way, it's kind of cool because that means you get you get a little bit of that creaminess um, without it necessarily being uh, surly, you know, resting on lees. Um, but you get that, that mallow lactic kind of, you know, um, milky or creamy quality to it. Um, but it's not just 100% that. So I'm going to say there's, there's probably a little bit of that. Uh, could be half of it. 50% of the wine was done that way and the other half wasn't. Um, definitely some oak influence, but I don't feel like it's a lot. Again, they could have had some stainless steel aging along with some barrel aging. Um, it's, it's very common uh, with New World Chardonnays is that they don't do 100% of either. They kind of mix it up. And it's really, you know, you've got to think about it. It's like a chef with, you know, with a recipe. Like, we're going to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The oak adds, you know, like like a type of seasoning or a spice to it. Um, whereas the stainless steel kind of just lets the, the grape just do its own thing. So, um, yeah, there's something... See, there's this flavor I will get sometimes with Chardonnay, and I have yet to describe it to you, um, but it just reminds me of something, and I can't put my finger on it. But definitely some trop tropical fruits in there. Good acid. and It, it kind of feels... Like uh, it's a little fuzzy. Like I'm getting some some skin contact with you know with a with a fruit. Um, not really sure what's going on there, but and it's not bad. It just just kind of feels fleshy, not fleshy, but like like a getting a biting into a peach and get that peach fuzz. Um, so you got a little bit of that. Might be some tannins going on here. Maybe from the skin. Maybe there's some little bit of skin contact. Um, just get that mouth feel. Um, but it's a good wine. I mean, it's good. Um, it's 48 bucks, or at least it was if, when it was being sold in 2008. Um, and they've got some pretty, you know, well, a lot, most of really they're Pinot Noirs. Their most expensive shard on the website, uh, they only had two Chardonnays on here, uh, is $29. So, um, but they, in this underground sellers they offer, they had a whole bunch of other Chard not a whole bunch, but they had a few other Chardonnays that were, you know, 48 bucks. Um, a couple of them, I think, a little bit pricier. But, I mean, it's it's not a cheap Chardonnay. 
if you can find this particular one, you know, I definitely would check it out. It's good, okay? It's good quality, it's balanced, it's well made. So, I mean, this is not your $10 Chardonnay, nor should it be. Sometimes you guys swallow the wine. Sorry, man. It's good. It's tasty. Like I said, it's it's got this richness to it. Um, it's got a good body to it. It's got good acid. Um, it's not over the top fruity. It's not over the top creamy. It's a good balance of everything. If you find it, which it might be a little difficult to find, and it's, you know, what, six years old? It's holding up really well. Um, it is does not... is it. If you told me this was a 2012 or 13, I would absolutely believe you. Absolutely believe you. It's it's youthful enough. All right, let's move on to the next wine. And we're going to have a little bit of fun here. Move this off to the side. Okay. Can you tell what I'm about to do now? All right, so white Zinfandel. Why in the, would I do white Zinfandel? Why would I do it? Now, everybody's going to tell you, oh, white Zinfandel is a good wine for Thanksgiving. It's that, it's that good wine for Aunt Tess, who doesn't really like wine, but it's kind of sweet. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you this. I really have not, I, I rag on white Zin. I really do. I, just about every wine professional does. If you like white Zin, cool. I've also, in my far as my memory is, I don't think I've ever in my life had white Zinfandel. Ever. So I'm going to have two of them. Well, that's pretty amazing. I'm going to have two white Zins. So, well, let's see how it is. Um, so anyway, white Zinfandel. So let's kind of go through some history first before we start pouring these wines. Um, now, these are from Behringer. And... Um, we're going to go through the history of White Zin itself first. So obviously, it's the Zinfandel grape, okay? And uh, when I first got into wine, I was given a bottle, uh, not given, but I was, I was given a glass of um, uh, Ravenswood uh, Zinfandel. And the bartender at the place I went to was all excited, I guess, because they just got it in and she just learned about Zinfandel. And this is like 2000, probably one it's got to be 2001. So um, it's all exciting. She's like, oh, this is the original Red Zin. So even at this point, they were still calling it Red Zin versus just Zinfandel to, to distinguish it from White Zinfandel. Um, so White Zinfandel uh, was being made, uh, was like the, like, like the Book of Knowledge says, uh, historically inexp inexpensive jug wine. So um, it was first, Zinfandel grape was first made into a rosé wine in 1869 by the El Pinal Winery in Lodi, California. Um, the resulting wine was thought of highly enough that the California Viticultural Commissioner Charles Wetmore, later, founded, later founder of Cresta Blanca Winery, advocated Zinfandel's use as a white grape. So 140-something years ago, they made a rosé out of it, so but a rosé most likely in a dry style, okay? Um, in the 1970s, Sutter Home Winery was a producer of premium Zinfandel red wine uh, in Napa. So um, to increase concentration in their wines, they used the Sangye uh, technique, S-A-I-G-N-E-E, -E, which is basically is the word for bleed or blood in French. Um, so... They use that technique to bleed off some of the grape juice before fermentation to increase the impact of compounds in the skins of the remaining wine. So, you know, get that extra concentration. So the, instead of diluting the wine, you're trying to, you know, trying to remove some of that uh, water effectively to get more concentration. Um, the excess juice was separately fermented into a dry, almost white wine that Sutter Home called White Zinfandel. So they're... They're the people that pretty much invented white, they are the ones who invented white Zinfandel and what they called it. Now in 1975, 
the Sutter Holmes White Zinfandel experienced a stuck fermentation. That's where the yeast don't fully ferment, so you get sweetness in the wine. So you don't fully ferment to dry. Um, so this problem juice was set aside. Some weeks later, the winemaker tasted it and preferred this accidental result, which was a sweet pink wine. Um, this is the style that became popular and today is known as White Zinfandel, but in the early days it was known as Cabernet Blanc or White Cabernet. Now it doesn't say why, and, and the link that's in here goes to a decanter article that doesn't exist, or you can't at least, or at least you can't access anymore. Um, like, like I mean, maybe if I was a member of decanter.com, I could probably access it. Uh, anyway, Sutter Home realized they could sell far more White Zin than anything they had produced to date and gradually became a successful producer of inexpensive wines. They remain one of the biggest producers of the wine of White Zin with annual shipments of over 4 million cases. Now, that, that number is a little old. Um, I'm not sure how old it is, but it's, it's definitely not like in the past year or two. And um, one of the things to also note is White Zinfandel outsells Red Zinfandel 6 to 1. And now, at first they were using, you know, the old Zinfandel vines um, in Napa and Sonoma and all that to make white Zin. But then red Zinfandel, you know, Zin, started to become a um, more popular wine. In the 80s, people in the United States started kind of going, hey, maybe there's something to like this better wine, you know, rather than jug wine and, and you know, really, really inexpensive wine. You know, like maybe there's something to like the quote fine wine, and so Zinfandel was starting to get into that, into that, um, uh, starting to get a little more in demand. So what happened is th those vines that were in Napa and Sonoma and in the you know the the areas that were older Zin planting. Some of these are you know from pre-prohibition um, because some of these wines were being used for sacramental wine. Um, so they decided, well, we don't have enough wine vines to make this white Zin, because we gotta make, one, we gotta make white Zin, but two, we wanna make this cool, just regular Zin. So they started planting a bunch of Zinfandel in the uh, Central Valley, which when we went to Napa, we drove up on I-5, and you see it, just vineyards upon vineyards, and the canopy's different. It's like, um, it, it's it's not it's not a trellis, it's, I don't know, the way they described it, it's like, it's like your hand here, and instead of like the little, um, instead of like the, you know, you have a, the, the vine and then it has this here and then it, the, the, the shoot, the shoots up like, like, like this, like a hand, it's like this. And then you have this canopy that comes across. Okay. Really helps protect the grapes. Um, so when they get really high yield, um, and it's, they're not really worried about high quality. So Central Valley is, you know, very fertile for the most part area. Granted, where we drove through, there's a whole bunch of water restriction things and water stuff. This is, of course, election, like like a couple of days for election day. So all these signs up there about water, some water uh, proposition that they had on, on the ballot. But um, so it's uh, the Central Valley is where they, they did it. And that light just went out. So we got to go faster. Also, we're going to be in the dark. All right. So... Um, I'm really upset about that. Anyway, so um, White Zin. So Behringer. Now, first of all, Behringer has been around for a very long time. They are one of the first wineries just like, um, um, whatchamacallit. Oh, actually, we're gonna get Segezi is one of the early wineries too. Um, so Behringer, one of the first wineries in, the, in, in, in Napa. Um, it was founded in... Well, in 1869, Jacob Berenger arrives in California, becomes a cellar foreman for Charles Krug. Okay. In 75, he and his brother purchased 215 acres in St. Helena um, and this parcel of land known, as, known first as Los Hermanos, the brothers, will become the heart of the Berenger estate. Um, you see, that light should not have gone off by now. Um, in 76, they oversee their first harvest and first crush. Um, and they make 40,000 gallons of wine, 18,000 cases. That's a lot of freaking wine. Um, and so pretty much from that point on, the, you know, they, they've got the winery going. Um, in 1920 to 1933, they continue to operate through prohibition under a federal license that allows them to make, uh, make wine for religious purposes. So Behringer can sell sacramental wine to churches. So from 20 to 33. 
34 prohibition is repealed, and they, they become the first winery to offer public tours. Um, I'll just, I'm going to skip through a whole bunch of stuff. It pretty much stays in the family, okay, through all this time. Um, just kind of make note. Uh, so Bob Steinhauer becomes a vineyard manager in 79, and... Um, well, first of all, in 71, Myron Nightingale joins Beringer as the fifth winemaker in, the, in their history. Um, and then you have a gentleman named Ed Sabraja joins Beringer as Myron's, Myron Nightingale's assistant. Sabraja is another kind of one of these names. You start connecting the dots in Napa. He's one of the names, winemaker names. He has a wine also. Um, just trying to see if there's anything else in here I really want to talk about. Um, not really. Not that there isn't anything here important. Oh, yeah. In 2001, at, on the 125th anniversary, um, they are called the oldest continuously operating winery in Napa Valley. All right, so, so they've been around for a while. Okay? So what I wanted, the reason why I got this, and this really kind of sucks, but I've already looked at it ahead of time, is I've got two, I've got two white Zins. So um, this one did not pay for it. It was at the parents' condo down in the coast. Have no idea how much they paid for it, but it's a 2009? 2009. It's probably not any good. Oh, geez. You know what? Hold on. We're going to get a little radical here. A little radical here. Now, oh, now I look like an Oompa Loompa. So, I hate to do this to you guys. All right. I still look a little orange. Sorry about this, but we're going to have to try to, I'll have to fix it in the mix. Anyway, it's just the light up of there. It's good enough. It's good enough. I'm really sorry. I'm getting some, some lights I, I can plug in so I don't have to deal with the batteries going out, which normally they don't, but anyway. So, uh, Behringer. Uh, I didn't do anything in between other than just white balance and exposure. And that was all I did. Okay. So, um, so I bought, so this wine, so, so the reason I'm doing white Zin, so one of the, one of the interviews, uh, I did in Napa, um, and I don't remember which one I'll be quite honest. Um, it might've been, it might've been the Freemark one. Uh, but it was one of the interviews and I was talking about Thanksgiving and all that. And they were said, well, you should do white Zin. I started laughing. And actually, this might have been all off camera, too, to be honest. So, um, so we're talking, you should, do, you should do white Zin. I'm like, eh, well, you have, you know, for Aunt Tess. I think that's actually the name we used. So I was like, okay, well, I do have some white Zin at the house. So I looked at the white Zin, and, like, it's kind of coppery. And you can't really see it here, but it's kind of coppery when I look at this pink stuff. So um, I said, well, I probably should buy newer white Zin so that I at least have current, especially if this is not good, I'm not, I'm not like poo-pooing it, but I'm drinking, you know, what, uh, this is 2009, so it, I mean, it's only five years old. It can't go that bad that quick, right? But uh, I could tell that the color had changed, and, you know, let's be honest, it probably hadn't had the best storage. Um, it was in a condo that wasn't, you know, used a lot. Um, it was... Th I think it was actually in the refrigerator most of the time, but it might have been in the closet, you know. So I mean, depending on depending on the the temperature fluctuations in the apartment, there's nobody there. They had the apartment set at 80 degrees, so this could be a bad wine. So um, through no fault of anyone, other than just it's old and wasn't stored with the thinking of that it should be stored, you know, better. Now. I bought this wine. So this I have no price. I bought this wine at uh, Specs because I went to Walmart to try to buy this stuff, and I found all I found was non-vintage, and I bought it for some reason. I don't know why. It's only like fifty cents cheaper, by the way, for the non-vintage, which is American. It doesn't say California, but this one is the two thousand thirteen. Uh, Oh, white Zinfandel Chardonnay. Are you serious? I got the... Oh. I thought I looked at this. Well, you know what? Screw it. I bought it. I've already made it. It's Saturday night. I don't have time to make a video tomorrow. So it's a white Zinfandel Chardonnay mix. Uh, 
I've never exhibited a lot of anger on camera and I'm trying not to um, at myself, but I'm pretty um, disappointed that I, that I actually bought this. And I knew that they had this, but I just, I honestly read Chardonnay as California to be perfectly honest. All right, so anyway, um, it is California, 2013, so it can be anywhere in California. Now, I really don't know how much difference it's gonna taste with a Chardonnay blend, but I don't know if you can see it. I can totally see it. But, I mean, it looks pink like it normally would. I mean, I mean the white Zin over here, which this is just straight up white Zinfandel. So I might have to open this one up too. Anyway, uh, it's pink and this is kind of coppery and I don't know if you can see, I don't know if you can see the difference at all um, with the lighting in here and being kind of orange, but this is definitely, you might be able to see, I can't tell, the screen of the camera is too small. Um, but uh, you know, it's definitely a different color. So let's, let's go through this real quick. Ooh, this is probably bad. <laughs> this is a wine I would not drink probably, but this is probably bad. Yeah, it, it smells like it's just, it smells like it's cooked. Mm. No, we're not even going go any farther with that. I mean, it's got a bit of sweetness to it, but it's old and um, it's not any good. So for the purposes of just making sure I got Zinfandel, this is gonna be room temperature-ish, whereas the others are actually kind of um, cold. And all I was gonna do with this wine is dump it down the drain anyway, so I wasn't planning on drinking it. Yes, kids, it doesn't take that long to open a bottle of wine. So we're just gonna take this out of the mix. All right, so non-vintage white Zinfandel. There's a little bit of color difference. Again, not sure how well you can see it, but this is really, really kind of pink, and this is like a lighter pink. Uh, and, and the problem is I got a red tablecloth, but you can, I can really see that there's a difference there. And I'm gonna dump it again, just to make sure I don't have wine from the other wine influencing the color makeup. Because it did almost look a little coppery. Real quick from my side. Yeah. So this one has a little bit darker pink to it. So very likely, very likely it's maybe more skin contact with, with the Zin. But I'll be honest, they pretty much smell the same. I mean, I can see why people drink it. In all honesty, they pretty much taste the same. Um, so if you want something that's kind of sweet, um, it's got a lot of strawberry on it. It's really like a, it almost feels like it's a little bit of frizzante, a little frizzante. Um, it's sweet. It actually kind of tastes like a lot of the other sweet red wines in Texas. And you know I don't like sweet red wines. I, I can't, I, I'm not gonna give you a recommendation or not on this because if you like this style of wine, you're gonna like it. If you don't, you're not gonna like this. I don't like this style of wine. But I wanted to try it. I wanted to at least give it a shot and give it some respect because you know it's it sells a sells a lot of wine. It's like 10% of the whole wine sales business is this wine, white Zin or white Zin Chardonnay. Um, so I wanted to be at least, if I don't like it, at least say I don't like it and just not as, just assume I don't like it. It's a quaffable wine. If it was hot out, it would probably be really refreshing. 
It's not a style I'm gonna really care for. If I want some sweetness in wine, I want it to be more of a white wine rather than a rosé, you know, or blush or whatever you wanna call it. But for Thanksgiving, I can see why this would be a good wine to have for people who aren't serious wine drinkers. It's, it's as far as a beverage, it would work with the food pairing, okay? This is, you know, oh, actually, you know why? Because that light had the big battery in it because the other big batteries didn't have a lot of charge. It's like, why is that light still on? Bottom line, if you like white Zin, more power to you. Um, I'm not judging, it's just not my style. It's not my preference of wine. I'm not really into it. I've tried it, okay? Now, again, Behringer makes a whole bunch of wine. They make low-end wine like this, and they make some pretty expensive wine, okay? Um, I don't, I'm not talking $1,000 bottles, but they make some really high-end wine. That's good wine, not just expensive. I've had their higher-end wine, and it's good. So, as a winery, as a winemaker, they make good stuff, okay? So, this is not to disparage it. Um, on the back, though, I, they, did, they did have this kind of, on this one, on the, on the, on the not generic, but the American, they had um, Style is Light and taste is semi-dry, which is probably right. Well, I hope it is, but it's not super sweet, okay? It's semi-sweet. That's what, you know, semi-dry means is got a little bit of sweetness to it. So it's got a little bit of residual sugar. Um, and it's, this one is 80% white Zin, 20% Chardonnay. So, I mean, it's pretty much white Zin. I mean, in, in, in as far as, you know, uh, what, what you could label it, you could label it white Zin. Okay, um, though I think if you put, I think California requires 85%. That's probably why they have, they say white Zin Chardonnay on it. Um, but anyway, not a style of wine that I am just going to go goo goo gaga over. But know that five year old white Zin, no matter who makes it, it's probably not worth drinking. Like, even if you like white Zin. It was a good experiment for me. All right, so let's move on real quickly to Segazio. Um, oh yeah, sorry, 539 for the White Zin Chardonnay blend. Uh, it was 497 for the non-vintage, uh, just regular old White Zin at Walmart. And like I said, I don't have a price for the 2009. Segazio, so let's, let's get into this. Get a little rinse to rinse out the White Zin. I don't know why I'm doing that again, but I'm gonna try to wrap this up real quick. And not to give Segazia the short, short end of the stick, but I don't wanna to spend too much more time than I need to. Segazio is another winery that's been around for quite a while. Um, first of all, real quick, this is the 2012 Segazio uh, Zinfandel, Sonoma County. Uh, bought it for $19.78 at specs, okay? So let's uh, close that, close that. Okay, so Segazio, uh, in 1886, Eduardo Segazio immigrates to Sonoma from Piedmonte, okay? Um, he begins to work as a winemaker at the at Italian Swiss colony. Um, it's one of those like wineries that I kind of knew about, but I don't really know a whole heck of a lot about it. Um, from 80, 1886 to 1902. Um, he gets married in 94. To Angela. Uh, in 1995, they purchase a modest home on 56 acres of prime vineyard land in northern Alexander Valley. The home ranch is planted to Zinfandel. They call it the home ranch. Um, in 1902, they start construction on the uh, winery, or I'm sorry, the winery construction is completed and they crush their first grapes. Um, let's see, and then from this point on, uh, they purchase more land. They they grow, they plant other Italian varietals. Uh, in 1919, they 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 don't think that prohibition is going to pass, so they actually purchase the Italian Swiss colony, uh, and it's 1,100 acres, um, six months prior to prohibition starting. 
Okay, and then there's this gap from 1919 to 1942. There's nothing in there that says they were making wine continuously. Uh, they may have, they may not, who knows. Um, then 1942, the River Road Vineyard in Alexander Valley's purchase. So throughout this, they, they buy more vineyards. Um, uh, and then from 1961 to 1979, uh, the Scazio family produces wine. Now, they're, they're buying vineyards and they're primarily grape growers from how this timeline reads. Um, but it, I think they also produce wine because it says they produce wine, okay? Um, it says wines are shipped via railroad and sold in San Francisco in horse and carts in 1903. But it looks like they, they kind of really are more focused on vineyard or, or wine, uh, growing, growing grapes because it says from 61 to 79, they produce wine from 50% of the red grapes grown in Sonoma County well, they produce the wine, right? And then they sell it to large wineries such as Krug, Martini, Almaden, and Roma. So it sounds like they are producing bulk wine and then selling it to these wineries so that they can repackage it uh, for themselves. Um, they buy a couple more. They buy another uh, vineyard in 71. Then in 1983, they bottle the first wines under the family label. And that's why... It looks like they maybe they're producing wines, but they weren't selling it under the Segazio name until 1983. Um, in 1993, um, they decide to shift the winery's focus to quality production with intensive hand farming and small lot fermentation. Uh, in 95, they celebrate 100 years as wine growers. Again, looks like they're more concentrating on being wine, you know, grape growers and farmers rather than winemakers. Um, and then in 2011, they join uh, the Crimson Wine Group, and I meant to pull that up. Uh, just, just know this, the Crimson Wine Group, oh, cool. The, uh, since I had it in the browser, it came up real quick. So they have uh, several brands. Um, they handle the Pine Ridge uh, brand. They handle Archery Summit, uh, Double Canyon, Luminary, uh, Shamasal, which used to be Domain, I forgot what it was, Domain Albert, I think it was, or Alfred. Uh, this is a luminary in Forefront. Forefront is another offshoot of Pine Ridge. So, um, uh, that's, that's who Crimson Wine Group is. So, again, um, it looks like uh, that... Segazio family is still involved with the winemaking. They're growing the winemaking. It's just that they're part of another, they're part of a larger conglomeration of uh, other wineries. Uh, Domain Alfred is the, what Shamasal or Chamasal is, okay? So, um, and they also grow other grape varietals, mostly, uh, really all Italian. Well, so they also have Petit Straw on here. Um, but they have um, Arnis. Fiano, Pinot Grigio, Barbera, and Sangiovese. Um, they also grow some Pinot Noir, and but they're known for their Zinfandel. And they got Zinfandel from all over. This Sonoma County is just like a, um, it's, I believe it's 50% from Alexander Valley and 50% from Dry Creek, if I remember correctly. And since I've got this going up here, I'll pull up the 2011 notes. And a blend of, not exactly 50-50, but a blend from Dry Creek and Alexander Valleys. So, um, but they also have uh, a thing called Home Ranch. They have Cortina, Old Vine, and then they have a, they have a brand called Rock Pile um, from the Rock Pile area of Sonoma. And um, this is Sonoma, right? Yeah. Do, do, do. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, is a narrow ridge 1,200 feet above Dry Creek Valley. So anyway, um, so they have quite a few wines that they've been making. Now, Zimadel is a wine I really, really like. And I've actually been wanting to try the Segazio, um, just because it, I don't know, the label's kind of cool. I like it. But just to try it out. So let's get into this. This was supposed to be a blind tasting wine for our Psalm group, but we just never did it, so. Now, there's um, 
kind of a sweetness to it. I'm actually a little concerned. I was concerned it might have been a little cooked, but it's not. But it's definitely, whew, 14, 14, 8. It looks like it says 14, 8, maybe 14, 9. So good amount of alcohol. That's why I was like, ooh, I, mean, I can feel it. So kind of prunish on the nose. Like and kind of dried grape type of stuff. That's why I was I thought might have been that type of the type of aroma that could have been a little too sweet, almost fig like. But on the uh, on the palate, Peppery, spicy, white pepper for days. Um, I still got a little bit of that prune-ish plum uh, fruit, really like purple fruit to it. Um, so it doesn't have like, you know, just like, like blackberries and cherries and, you know, uh, raspberry and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's mostly like spice and, um, and pepper. So, um, you know, pretty much what I would expect it to be. We're going to take a look at the 2011 notes just to kind of see if it says spicy, lush, black, black fruit, briary and raspberry flavors. Oh, briary, I get that too. I, I... And, and on the aroma, it's now, now that it's, it's kind of, we're going to dump that and we're going to pour again. Um, it's really starting to settle in and... There was like this, maybe like a, because I saw, you know, black fruit, but maybe like a blackberry, blackberry pie on the nose. Mm -hmm. Very briary and, you know, I, I used to say woodsy, but it really is briary is, is the better term to use. Um, but spicy. Um, it is kind of juicy, kind of the, the, the fruit. It isn't as plummy and pruny right now. So, you know, that, that first that first pour, the first taste, sometimes, you know, you get a little bit different thing and then things settle down, you know, opens up a little bit more. You know, it's good wine. Um, it's a little bit fruitier. Then maybe I want from a Zin, but I mean Zins are meant to be have a have good fruit to it, good spice, that that pepper, white black pepper quality to it. I mean, and it's 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 not heavily heavily tannic. Now, there's one thing that I do have to say. Um, it's maybe like medium tannins. Uh, alcohol is high. But this is going to stand up to all the all the uh, seasoning, all the flavors you're going to have with Thanksgiving dinner. It's going to complement it. It's just going to be, it's going to be it's going to fit right in. Okay, it's it's going to fit right in with all those spices that you're going to get. There's even a bit of clove in here. I can really feel the clove now. Um, it's just it's a good wine. Um, it's twenty bucks, so it's a good value. Um, it's I mean not ten dollars, but for what it is, 20 bucks, it tastes exactly what it should. It, it drinks like it should, it, you know, as far as the price point. If you told me this was a $30 bottle of wine, I'd believe you. So, I mean, it's it's right there. I mean, if you want a good, solid Zin um, that has all the flavor profile that I just described, then you're going to like this wine. I like it. Um, you know, I mean, it's a different, little bit different in the Zin than I've had before. But it's not bad. I mean, I like it. So I was like, guys, hey, this is good. I would buy it again.
So that that gives you a any indication, you know, that it's a good wine that I, that I like it. It then this is it. Yeah, and in in this is gonna be one of those wines. I if I let it sit out for a while, I mean, the the nose is just gonna get better and better and better. This is why you probably get the cant. I know it's only twenty bucks, but this is wine that would benefit from decanting. You open it up maybe half hour before people get over there, put it in the decanter. You know, maybe you put it back in the bottle. Um, it'll be easier to pour or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean this this wine is just it's good. And if you see it somewhere, get it. And what's cool is the, the minerality of it is, is really kind of balancing the fruit, the fruit character and starting to maybe overcome it. It's good. Well, we're going to wrap things up because it looks like I've gone almost an hour. Uh, these specials tend to run long anyway. Um, apologize for the lighting, but uh, you know what? Hey, it happens. So I'm going to get the plug-in kind. Actually, it's cool because they're plug-in and battery. So when I'm out in the field, I can do battery like I normally do if I can't get an access to power. But almost every interview I do, if as long as it's inside somewhere, there's a power outlet nearby or close enough for the, for the uh, extension cord to get to. So uh, uh, I'm pretty confident that anywhere I go, I'm going to be able to do it. But then always have uh, the batteries charged. The guy get different batteries though. He uses a different style battery, but that's okay. I'll just, you know, these, these will be my emergency. I don't have any other lights available. Just make sure the batteries are charged type of lights. So, um, but I'm going to buy those starting next year. Um, one, one light a month because it's like a hundred bucks each. So speaking of that, if you want to see me not have any lighting problems, the PayPal button right there. You can send some ducats my way. Help me pay for more White Zin or more Stigathio or more Iron Horse Chardonnay um, or anything else. Lights, whatever. Uh, friend me up above. Uh, I'm all over the internet, so friend me up over there. Um, hit the links below to check out Stigathio. Check out Behringer, especially check out, again, I'm not trying to disparage the Behringer White Zin, but you know, check out some of those stuff. I had some Quantum the other day. Quantum's a really good wine from them. I would highly suggest you try that. Um, it's, it's pretty tasty. Um, and then of course, Iron Horse. I'll even have a link to, if I remember, Underground Cellar, because they've got some cool deals. Yeah, you know, the, the they're, they're like a lot of these other like wine website deal places. So. Like I said, I can't find this on the website, so maybe it was a closeout. Probably was. They probably decided not to make it under that specific label anymore. Got to get rid of the inventory. But it doesn't mean the the wine is necessarily bad. I liked it, so it's not that it's you know crap wine they're trying to get rid of. But at the same time, it's it's maybe it wasn't a hot seller, and they're trying to they're trying to move inventory. I mean that's what businesses do in the retail industry. It's not that the product is bad. It's just that they've got other product coming in and they got to get the other product out. You know, I know when I manage my wine room, I got product I'm trying to get rid of. It's not bad wine. It's just not selling, you know, um, and, and I, you know, want to see, you know, I need to reduce that inventory so I can bring other stuff in that people want. Anyway, so um, like I said, from me up above, hit the links below, hit the PayPal button over there so I can buy more lights and that uh, they don't go out on me. And um, we will see everyone again, well, for the Christmas episode, but then the following week is Palmas, and then I think there's two, I think there's three episodes, and then Christmas, and then New Year's, and then back to Napa Valley slash Sonoma slash Arizona. See everyone again next time.